Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Jared Harshman, a PhD candidate at Oklahoma State University. So Jared, before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm originally from Maryland. I grew up 45 minutes from Baltimore and 45 minutes from Washington, D.C. Um, was very active in forage and FFA, showing all species of livestock, dairy cattle, beef cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs at, at all levels. Um, being active in forage and FFA brought me to livestock judging, which which brought me to Oklahoma, um, where I got a, an associate of science at Redlands Community College while I was part of the livestock judging team. And I transferred to Oklahoma State, where I've been the rest of my time uh, in college education, where I received my bachelor's, a master's in spawn nutrition, and now working on finishing up my PhD in, in swine nutrition here. Awesome. So let's talk about some of the work that you've been doing there at Oklahoma State. So I was reading that abstract that you've been doing, which looks kind of like a new pilot study co- sort of thing about looking at the incidence of prolapse in sows and trying to determine uh, causes and risk factors of that. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that study? Yes. Yeah, so um, I came up with a study and an idea to to look at the differences between prolapse and non-prolapse sows. Um, and the way we set this up was we were going to go find sows that had prolapsed and bleed them and then find a matched control sow, the same parity, same stage of production and same location under the same management and bleed her as the control sow. And that would allow us to compare different um, items in the, in the blood and serum to see, you know, what are the true differences that we can determine between these sows. Because right now, if we look at look at data and look at, you know, information that's out there, there's really nothing over prolapse in swine. So my task was to, you know, can we figure out something that's different between these prolapse, non-prolapse sows to help us minimize prolapse rate or, or ultimately, hopefully we can just get rid of it out of, as an issue in industry. But know just to to get rid of that issue and and make it my mi- more minor issue that we see so with this um we, when we started bleeding these sows we, we ultimately bled 44 prolapse sows and 44 matched control sows and one of the items that we we looked at was the serum trace mineral levels um so we we sent the serum samples to iowa state um, diagnostic lab and they were able to perform a 10 panel trace mineral analysis on the serum where we got calcium, copper, iron, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, zinc, manganese, molybdenum, selenium um, values from the serum in the prolapse and non-prolapse styles. Um, and with that, I also use those serum samples to look at inflammatory cytokines, um, TNF alpha, uh, between the prolapse and non-prolapse styles. And ultimately what we found in the results was is if you read literature, we think calcium, phosphorus, prolapse, and cattle. Um, however, we did not find those those to be significantly different um, in our samples. What we did find was was iron in the prolapse cell was significantly lower compared to the non-prolapse cell. And likewise, zinc was lower in the prolapse cell compared to the non-prolapse cell. And we found that, you know, something that's interesting is molybdenum was lower in the prolapse cell compared to the non-prolapse cell. And and that's something that's that's interesting because there's that's not reported in data. Um, we did see um, that magnesium was higher in the prolapse cells compared to the non-prolapse cells, and there was a tendency for selenium to be lower in our prolapse cells compared to our non-prolapse cells. So, of those ten minerals, there's some that you know are interesting that that will take some more work to figure out. You know, what's those differences really telling us? But some of those key ones we can see are different. Um, but also, we looked at TNF alpha, the inflammatory cytokine, and, and it's what we expected. You know, you figure inflammatory prolapse occurring; those prolapse cells had significantly higher TNF alpha levels compared to the non-prolapse cell. So all this together um, allows us to kind of get a little bit better understanding of the differences between our, our prolapse and non-prolapse cells, and it gives us a building block to further evaluate what are those differences. Those are nutritional factors that we can we can change, you know, time of when we feed or how much, you know, of certain minerals we add to the diet at certain times that could help reduce the prolapse rate that we're having. And also things to minimize, you know, such as TNF alpha is our nutritional strategies to, to limit those inflammatory cytokines that, that go back to oxidative stress, you know, another big issue that we have, um, that, that we have to deal with. But I, I think all this is unique and, 
it all comes together in a, in a way that we build off of it to look at other things. Um, as we talk about prolapse, we know it's multifactorial. So these two items are, are just a part of a bigger issue. But if we can start to understand of, you know, there's a, a difference in certain minerals and there's an increase in inflammatory cytokines and link those pieces together, we can use that to look at other items such as, you know, hormones and, and collagen and how all those come together um, and are potentially what are causing prolapse to occur. And the way, if we can better understand those, then we can start to actually make a difference with this big issue. Um, it, you know, and it, it's costing our industry a lot of money. Um, it, it's hard on the workers. So it's something that we, we need to understand and, and better get a grasp on. But however, we don't have the data at this point to, to really understand what's going on. So I'm using these, this study to kind of as a building block to, to further, you know, expand our knowledge of, of what's truly going on and is the difference between our prolapse and control, you know, non-prolapse cell. Gotcha. So I know this is still very early on in this research, but do you think the, the goal for this in the future would then be able to identify some of those potential causes for prolapsing cells and then try to reduce the incidence with some sort of um, nutritional intervention or do you think it would be more of like a genetic selection change or management practice or what what are you kind of seeing with those results with these results what what i'm seeing is is it's going to take a combination of all of those you know re research that's out there shows that there is a part of heritability for this prolapse but i think that we need to get that under control but also how we manage you know guilt development and in these cells, because if you if you look at some of this data, the majority of your prolapses are those early parodies, those zero, one, two, three parity cells are, are where we're seeing the peak of, of prolapses. So we're gonna have to do some management strategies to try to, to reduce this risk, but also nutritional strategies. You know, what what can we change from the the mineral aspects and to make an impact to reduce this prolapse? But I don't think it's one one silver bullet. I think it's multi it's you know multiple factors that have to come together. And I think genetics, management, nutrition, all we, we need to, to dig deeper into that and, and figure out how we could minimize this issue. So clearly kind of what you mentioned earlier, because this is like a building block, clearly this is not a one and done study. This is something that's going to have multiple different branches that you kind of reach out to and try to dig deeper into this. So I guess my next question then would be, what would be the next step for you or your team in terms of this research? Like what, how exactly would you kind of dig deeper to try to identify more of the cause and effect relationship here so the, the next steps actually undergoing right now um we're we're doing a study where we're bleeding sows when they come into farrowing and creating a serum bank and then that you know that group of sows if one prolapses out of there we're going to bleed her again and we're likewise to this study we're going to bleed a, a matched control sow the same parity and, and all of those those things and look at the differences between when she entered into farrowing to when she prolapsed and, and what's those changes in those minerals and inflammatory cytokines, you know, is that the, the area where we could make an adjustment from a management nutrition standpoint that could reduce prolapse. Um, but I, I've also got a lot of other studies in the back of my mind that I would like to, to go out and do. Um, but as I come close to the end of my PhD, really don't have the time to to start other trials because some of these would, would take quite a bit of time but i think this gives a building block for for other students and, and people in the industry to, to really learn and start digging into this issue because we know it, it, it's it's a whole whole wide industry issue here in the united states and we don't understand it so we're we all need to try to figure out what we can do to minimize it and and reduce the issue Gotcha. Well, I think that's all the time we have uh, today for this episode. But reading your abstract, it looks like there's still plenty of other results because you just touched on the minerals and then the inflammatory cytokines basically today. But I saw, I mean, in the abstract, you talked about some collagen levels and all sorts of different things that could be a factor. So for those listening, look out for a second episode coming up because there's plenty to talk to or talk about on this subject. Um, but yeah, Jared, thanks for coming on the show. And um, We'll appreciate you having you for the second episode here in the future. Yep. Thank you. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode. 
and we are constantly on the lookout for the latest updates in swine nutrition. And if you have a swine nutrition related research trial that you would be able to share on our podcast, please send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to talk about your research. See you later.